Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a channel called Core Academy of Science, which despite trying to sound sciencey, is a creationist channel. The video I'm looking at today is called Ask a Creationist, Evidence Against Evolution, The Final Part. In this video, well, do I really need to say what he's going to attempt to do when it's titled like that? Probably not, you can figure out what kind of a video this will be from that. Also, yes, I am doing today's video as an avatar video. I've been dealing with a family emergency this week, so I didn't have time for my regular facehole videos. It might be this way next week too, depending on how much time I have. Anyway, let's go! Welcome back to Ask a Creationist. I'm Todd Wood. I'm a young age creationist. I'm here to answer your questions about evolution, creation, origins, the Bible, Genesis, science, faith, philosophy, whatever you got. Hello, Todd Wood. I'm Vice Rhino, a former creationist. I'm here to most likely explain why your answers to questions about evolution, creation, origins, the Bible, Genesis, science, faith, philosophy, whatever you got, are wrong. Now, that doesn't mean I'm starting with the assumption that he's wrong. As a creationist, I can pretty much guarantee that he's wrong about evolution, creation, origins, and science, but it wouldn't surprise me if he got some stuff right about the Bible, Genesis, faith, or philosophy. Though, based on my previous experience with creationists, I'm not exactly hopeful about that either. We are dealing with the ongoing question, is there evidence against evolution? I know a lot of people are going to hate this, but that depends entirely on how we're defining evidence and what context we're using it in. Are there individual data points that, if you ignore their larger biological context, appear to point to the conclusion that evolution did not or does not happen? Sure. Are there things for which no evolutionary explanation is known, and if there turns out to be no evolutionary explanation, that would mean that evolution is not true? Again, sure. But this is the problem here. The only bits of evidence that point away from evolution are things that either require you to ignore their larger biological context, or boil down to being arguments from ignorance. Or as I like to phrase it, is there evidence inconsistent with or poorly explained by evolution? Ah, so you are on the same track as I am word game wise. Yes, there are things that, again, if you ignore their larger biological context, appear to be either inconsistent with or poorly explained by evolution. And you could say that that is technically evidence against evolution, but the evidence in favor of evolution overwhelms these inconsistencies or poor explanations by so much that we can, at this point, basically consider evolution to be one of the most well-evidenced scientific theories that there is. So even if I grant every point that he is going to make throughout this video, ultimately it does not disprove evolution. At best, it will highlight specific things about evolution that are not yet fully understood. And what's worse, even if a creationist did manage to accumulate so much evidence against evolution that it was definitively proven wrong, that still doesn't prove creation. That merely leaves us searching for evidence in favor of a new process that caused life to diversify. But let's be real here, there have been so many scientific discoveries over the last century and a half that had the potential to completely pull the rug out from under evolution, but either failed to do so, or wound up providing additional evidence for evolution, that you'd be more likely to disprove the theory of gravity than evolution at this point. The discovery of radioactivity, the development of Einstein's theory of relativity, genetics, epigenetics, the narrowing down of the estimated age of the Earth, and so on. Contrary to what creationists would have you believe, researchers working in these fields did not start with evolution as an assumption and then work backward from there. Most of them probably didn't care all that much about evolution, or they would have become biologists rather than physicists and geologists. Well, genetics and epigenetics are the exception there, but again, both of those fields could have shown that traits were not heritable in a way that is conducive to evolution, but instead they showed the opposite. First of all, that all models have anomalous data. Evolution is a model in science. All scientific models have anomalous data, things that are poorly explained or not explained. And so, Evolution has things that it doesn't explain very well. It just does. That's how it works. You can't, you can't have a perfect mob. I don't know that I'm comfortable stating that in such an absolute manner, but I certainly can't think of a model that is actually a perfect one-to-one -one match with reality with zero anomalous data. But putting aside the absolute nature of the claim, it is important to recognize that evolution is not itself a model. It is a theory. 
There are evolutionary models within the theory, with some being more robust than others, but if you disprove an evolutionary model, that does not actually disprove the theory of evolution as a whole. Think of a model as a lens through which we view data, with the goal of linking the data to a theory. The model bridges that gap. Punctuated equilibrium, for instance, is an evolutionary model, as is the competing model, gradualism. And both models have anomalous data. That is, neither is 100% accurate to how evolution happens all the time, with it looking like sometimes things evolve gradualistically, other times they evolve in accordance with punctuated equilibrium, and even other times, most times, it'll be a mix of the two. The first big one that I pointed out was this notion that the classification scheme is just far more complex than a nested hierarchy. So Darwin basically constructed his evolutionary argument on the, on the idea that the classification scheme looks like a genealogy, and it sort of does if you stand back and squint and don't look at the details. But when you get really up close, you realize, holy cow, this thing is like a bowl of spaghetti. Well, more like a bush than a bowl of spaghetti. Or a web if we're looking at organisms that are capable of horizontal gene transfer. Those guys fuck the tree of life right up. But setting those aside for the moment, phylogenies always end up as nested hierarchies. The problem is that, with how many species exist and have existed, there are several potential phylogenies for any given set of species, and figuring out which one is the correct one can be difficult. And that's not even getting into the fact that individual genes can also have phylogenies, and the phylogeny of a specific gene does not necessarily match up with the phylogeny of the organisms that gene can be found in. There are several different analytical methods that can be used to construct phylogenies, and all of them have benefits and drawbacks. Ideally, to maximize our confidence that any particular phylogeny is the correct one, we would want to see that phylogeny independently derived using multiple different methods. And this is likely why Todd is saying that if you look at the broader picture, it looks like a tree of life, but when you zoom in it gets messy. Because when you zoom out to the broad tree of life phylogeny, it has been independently confirmed using multiple methods. So we can say with relative certainty that all organisms whose cells have mitochondria and a nucleus share a common ancestor, and that the lineage is split with the addition of chloroplasts in the group that became plants, with the non-plant group splitting again with the development of organs, the nervous and vascular system, whether the butthole or the mouth was the first hole to form during development, the spinal cord, jaws, digits, etc. But when you get to the more specific characteristics, it becomes more difficult to figure out, because when you construct a phylogeny by only looking at one specific character trait, it could potentially conflict with a phylogeny that was created by looking at a different specific character trait in the same organism. And this is further complicated by the fact that this is usually done in the context of determining the relatedness of extant organisms, which involves figuring out which extinct organisms were in their lineage, and which one is a potential common ancestor. And given that the vast majority of organisms to ever have existed are currently extinct, and the vast majority of extinct organisms are unknown to us, this is why phylogenies are usually drawn based on character traits rather than specific organisms. We don't know what organism first developed a notochord, but we do know that a whole bunch of animals all share that character trait, and when we put it in a phylogeny that also takes other character traits into consideration, such as fetal development involving an amnion, placentas, digits, etc., then it ends up grouping as a nested hierarchy. So yeah, when you zoom out and look at the large category-defining character traits, it is an unambiguous nested hierarchy. But when you look at the specifics, it still winds up being a nested hierarchy, it just gets so messy that there ends up being different potentially correct nested hierarchies rather than a singular unambiguously correct one, and so researchers have to figure out the one that best fits the data. And it doesn't, you know, does it fit evolution? It might. Not it might, it does. Like, I find it quite telling that you admit that the zoomed out broad picture obviously fits a nested hierarchy, and that this doesn't get complicated until you get to the specifics, because that's exactly what would be expected if evolution were true, and that's the way life works a lot of the time. Like, I've often used computer programming as an analogy in various ways in my videos, and always, 100% of the time, there will end up being someone in the comments with more knowledge and experience than me explaining why what I said is broadly true, but when you get into the specific details of exactly how it works, it's more complicated than that and can wind up not being entirely accurate for the analogy I was making. This doesn't make the broad statement wrong, it just means that broad statements don't necessarily work the same way when you get more granular and specific. If they did, then we wouldn't need language to describe that difference in the first place. Evolution could be, you know, changed to fit it, but 
what does that then do to Darwin's original argument? And it certainly opens up the possibility that there are other and better explanations. I'm not entirely sure what he means by this, but it appears to be him referencing the creationist trope where they complain that evolutionary explanations keep changing. So one day, a species that was thought to belong to the genus Homo, which includes all human species, might be reclassified as belonging to Australopithecus. But this isn't us changing evolution in a desperate ploy to make it work in spite of the data. This is us changing our view of evolution in order to make it work in light of the data. Such reclassification happens when we learn something new. And in an amusing turn of events, when I was looking for a video that I've made in the past pointing out that creationists engage in the same reclassification behavior in their own journals, lo and behold, the example that I used in that video was an argument about the species Australopithecus sediba. In the Answers Research Journal, there was an argument in 2010 about whether the species was a human or an ape, which I have used as an example of how not even creationists know where to draw the line between humans and apes. So when they say this species is clearly just an ape, while this other one is clearly human, they're overstating their own case. But why is that amusing? Because one of the papers, the one arguing for Sediba being human, was authored by none other than Todd Wood, the guy I'm currently responding to. So it's a bit rich to hear him complain about evolutionists changing things to fit with evolution when he was directly involved in that exact kind of debate in a creationist journal. I also noted that island biogeography, the thing that really clinched evolution in the mind of Darwin, is generally, and I mean generally, not always, but generally limited to examples of evolution that are limited, right? So things like, you know, unique genera, unique species, unique subspecies are on islands. Even though there are some islands that have been around for millions of years, you still have or, you know, according to the conventional time scale, you still have very, very limited examples of, of evolutionary change. I'm not sure how that's even relevant. Biogeography is basically the study of geography's impact on evolution, how organisms interact with their environment, how their environment can limit or encourage movement, etc. It brings the study of evolution together with the study of ecology and geology in order to make sense of ecological diversity. Yes, examples of biogeography usually center around isolated island populations and how they differ from their mainland counterparts, but that's simply because that's where the contrast is most obvious. But biogeography isn't limited to isolated populations. I mean, I guess he did specify island biogeography, but I wonder why that specification is relevant rather than just looking at the science of biogeography as a whole. Specific to island biogeography, he said that the issue is that some islands have been around for millions of years, but the amount of evolution we see in the species on those islands is limited. Well, since he brought up Darwin being convinced by island biogeography, presumably referring to the Galapagos finches, which, worth mentioning, weren't as big a deal to Darwin as we usually think they were today, he collected specimens of the finches while on the Beagle in 1835, but he didn't keep good records of which specimens were collected from which islands, and he didn't notice their significance until John Gould of the Museum of the Zoological Society of London was asked by Darwin to catalogue them. Gould was actually the first to notice that the finch specimens were closely related and slightly more distantly related to a species species on the mainland, which Darwin then elaborated on when he wrote The Voyage of the Beagle. The finches originally arrived on the Galapagos about three million years ago, and in the ensuing time have evolved into 15 distinct species. Todd seems to have taken issue with how long an island has existed for, compared to how much evolution has happened, and I'm not sure if he just misspoke or if this was deliberate, but the more important metric is how long it has been since the organism we are looking at originally arrived on the island, as it is possible for an island to exist before the arrival of an organism that can be found on it now. In fact, I'd say that it's rather necessary for an island to exist before you can find things on that island, but what do I know? Back to the finches, 15 species in 3 million years is pretty fast, evolutionarily speaking, and by studying the finches we are able to learn more about mechanisms of speciation and hybridization, evolution of cognitive behaviors, principles of beak-jaw biomechanics, as well as the underlying developmental genetic mechanisms in generating morphological diversity. So really, I'm just completely unsure of what the complaint here even is. Which I don't really have a problem with, but the question is, you know, does this... You, if we extrapolate, does that really explain everything? No, of course island biogeography doesn't explain the whole of evolution, and it's silly to think that it would. 
But if you're concerned about how small the changes are, we've also observed rather large changes for what are, evolutionarily speaking, extremely short time frames. For instance, the lizards that were intentionally introduced to a new island in 1971. When researchers came back to study them 36 years later, they found significant differences between them and their ancestors that came about largely because of the necessary dietary changes that the lizards had to make in order to survive in the new environment. They had to eat more plant matter, which is more difficult both to just eat and to digest. In response to the selection pressure, the lizards developed a different head size and shape, a stronger bite, and the evolution of a brand new fermentation chamber in their intestines, courtesy of a couple new sequel valves. What amounts to the beginnings of an entirely new organ happening in just a few decades is hardly something that I would complain is too small. If we look at macrobiogeography, the patterns of species across the planet, things get really muddy and muddled, and sometimes we're in for really big surprises, things like the ratites. And I gave that example in the episodes. I suggest you go check that out. It's peculiar and weird, and I'm not sure what to think about it, but it doesn't really fit very well with the simple evolutionary explanation because things are always more complicated than they seem. I feel like not fitting a simplified model isn't a problem for the theory as a whole. And yeah, the category of flightless birds known as ratites does not fit a simplified model. When looking into this claim, one of the most common things I came across in the studies that were trying to work out ratite phylogeny was a statement about how this particular group has been controversial for over a century. In his earlier video on ratites, his point seemed to be that the various species of ratites that were located in places that were closest to each other when Gondwana split did not seem to be all that closely related, with weird things like the extinct elephant bird of Madagascar being most closely related to the kiwis of New Zealand rather than the ostriches of Africa. He made use of a simplified version of one specific phylogeny that appears to have been from a 2020 paper, and is in agreement with another phylogeny from a more recent 2023 paper, and I have no issue with this. The question with regards to the ratites is not did they evolve or were they specially created, and I don't think Todd, or indeed pretty much any creationist, would disagree with that. They'd say that the ratites were part of the same created kind, so of course they are related to each other. So the only point in bringing this up would be to throw shade on evolutionary methods. They can't even figure out the relationship in this small group of obviously related birds, so how can we trust them when they say that humans are related to the rest of the apes? Aside from being logically fallacious, this ignores the fact that the reason the ratites are such a problem in the first place is exactly because evolutionary biologists do not ignore difficult data. Morphologically as well as geographically, we would expect ostriches and elephant birds to be pretty closely related, so the discovery that elephant birds are more closely related to kiwis than to ostriches was unexpected. But that didn't stop them from doing that research and then publishing it. Now, in the case of this specific group of birds, the problem is likely caused by that thing I mentioned earlier about how the phylogeny of a particular gene is not necessarily the same as the phylogeny for the species in which that gene is found. The technical term for that is incomplete lineage sorting, or ILS. And just to provide a fairly easy to understand example of how it works, let's say that in a hypothetical future, humans diverge into three distinct species, call them species A, B, and C. In these species, there is a gene that controls eye color. For the sake of this example, let's say that currently humans can only ever have brown eyes. Boring, I know, but this is just a hypothetical. But before the humans of today split into these three species, we mutated so that some people can actually have blue eyes, so it's getting better. But when the species split, A split first and only ever got the version of the gene that allowed for brown eyes, while well, the lineages that would lead to B and C got both. But then when the B and C lineages split, B also ended up with only brown eyes, and C ended up with only blue eyes. So if we look at this phylogeny based on the species, B and C are more closely related to each other than either is to A. But if we look at the phylogeny based on this gene, then A and B will appear to be more closely related. This is not the only mechanism that can create the effect of ILS, but it is the most prevalent and is most likely to impact lineages that are in the process of evolving rapidly, where novel alleles do not have time to become fixed in the whole population before genetic isolation occurs. And there is evidence that this type of ILS is the main thing that has made the ratite phylogeny so difficult to figure out. Anyway, yeah, all of this to say that not fitting an oversimplified model does not cast the overall theory that model is a part of in doubt. It simply means that we either need to revise the model or come up with a better one. I kind of, you know, bailed on the fossil record. 
It could have other explanations, but that's really more of a geological question, and I'm a biologist, and this is about evolution, and so it's kind of a cop-out, I know, sorry. Honestly, I actually appreciate it when experts decline to comment on fields that are not their area of expertise. That being said, to say that there are other explanations for the fossil record other than evolutionary ones is more than a bit disingenuous. The appropriate thing to do when you're not an expert in something is to figure out what it is that the experts can agree on and go with that. So, for instance, I briefly considered pointing to other papers that disagree with the radite phylogeny that Todd showed in his other video, but there is very little agreement among experts as to what the correct phylogeny even is, so I'm not even remotely qualified to speak on that authoritatively. Instead, I went for the this is why this particular thing is such a mess approach, as one of the skills that I've developed over the years is an ability to explain technical concepts in plain language that's more approachable for the casual viewer than technical papers are. That said, I also recognize that I'm not a scientist, and even among scientists, reading papers that are outside your area of expertise can be hard. There are often words that might be fairly common in everyday language, but which have different specific meanings in their scientific context, and that can mean different things depending on what specific scientific field you're talking about. So while I do consider myself relatively skilled at reading and understanding technical papers, I'm also aware of my limitations and am most definitely open to being corrected by people who actually know better than me. All this to say that when a biologist says I'm not qualified to talk about whether or not the fossil record supports evolution, but there are explanations other than the evolutionary one, they're just wrong. I mean, I guess technically you could say that there are other explanations, but there are no other scientifically supported explanations. They were all buried there during Noah's flood is just as ridiculous an explanation as Satan put them there to trick us, despite the attempts that creationists make to add a patina of science to it. But while they are scientifically ridiculous, they are technically explanations, just not good ones. And then I argued that unguided, abiotic origin of life seems quite impossible from a chemical point of view. Well, as a biologist, specifically with a PhD in biochemistry, you should be aware that life is essentially a cascade of chemical reactions. It's a very complex cascade, to be sure, but there is no reason to think that any given chemical interaction that is required for life is impossible outside of life, and Origins researchers have outlined several plausible pathways that could lead from simple non-life chemical reactions to simple versions of life. In fact, in a review of past Origins research that also discusses potential future research paths, they point out that biology actually plays very little role in Origins research, as biology is primarily concerned with life as we know it today, while the first life would have been little more than a handful of self-replicating reactions contained in a protocell. This isn't to say that biology is irrelevant or doesn't play any role. The study and comparison of prokaryotic genomes has been invaluable in figuring out what genetic functions would be the most essential for early proto-life forms to have, after all. But ultimately, the main issue with Origins research is not one of plausibility, it's one of falsifiability. There are multiple paths that life could have taken, and ultimately we have no way of knowing which path it actually did take. So even if researchers someday set up a perfect prebiotic Earth simulation that successfully and unambiguously develops life from non-life, that does not prove that their simulation matches what actually happened on the early Earth. So yeah, the real problem with Origins research is not that we don't have a clue about how life began, it's that we have too many clues about how life could have begun, and no time machine to go back and confirm which ones are historically accurate. I stand by that pretty firmly, but this is really sort of the edge of evolution. It's really not, it's really not evolutionary biology proper, it's not what evolutionists think about and study. Yes. Abiogenesis is separate from evolution. To quote the paper that pointed out that biology had surprisingly little to do with Origins research, when explaining why, they say, By looking at whole living systems, biology has much in its hands and a gap still remains between 1. Experimental biology looking at specific mechanistic aspects in a cell or organism, example metabolism, a particular enzyme or pathways, and 2. The larger, yet microscopic, picture of how life as a whole started, which falls out of the traditional interpretation of the theory of evolution. I'm glad a creationist has finally explicitly stated that abiogenesis is not evolution, nor is it included in the theory of evolution, because that's something that people who deny evolution get hung up on a lot. They'll be presented with a buttload of evidence that points directly to evolution, and then move the goalpost back to, yeah, but you don't know how it got started, as if that somehow casts doubt on evolution itself. 
And that's really the kicker here. You can say that us not knowing how life started means that God did it, if you like, but that doesn't change the fact that evolution has been happening for over three billion years at this point. It is also a rather blatant God of the Gaps argument. We don't know how life started, therefore God. You still, if, if, you, if you're insisting on sort of a, a no God meddling model, right? So perfectly naturalistic model where God does not interfere at all, then you still have, you can't get evolution even going. So how, so what kind of a model is that? And there's the goalpost shift. The idea that a thing that you can see happening today couldn't possibly actually be happening today because you can't explain how it began is just bonkers. This would be the equivalent of observing the three known sednoid objects, which are outer solar system planetoids with extreme elliptical orbits, and declaring that they do not exist because astronomers haven't figured out how their orbits could be possible. Denying observable reality because some of the specifics about how reality became what it is are unknown is still an exercise in denying reality. And finally, on the last episode, I argued that I, from my perspective, altruism poses rather important explanatory difficulties for natural selection. It's really hard for me to imagine, and I think it's hard for a lot of biologists to imagine how in the world something so amazingly complex as a beehive could have originated simply by natural selection. Okay, yeah, when you said altruism, I immediately thought human altruism, but I can see how you got to beehive from altruism. But ultimately, we are once again arriving at an argument from ignorance here. I don't know how a beehive could have evolved, therefore God. Anyway, the explanation for altruism, whether that be referring to human actions or beehives, is essentially the same, group selection. Natural selection does not solely operate on the individual level, it operates on the group level as well. So while selection pressures might favor individuals who behave selfishly, hoarding resources and refusing to cooperate with others, a group comprised of such individuals will often be selected against if there is a competing group with individuals more inclined to cooperate and make individual sacrifices for the benefit of the whole. Both sides of the aisle, I might add, evolutionists and creationists, might be thinking, you know, is that all you got? Right? No, I don't think that's all you got. But honestly, the core point of your presentation does include basically all the fundamental arguments that creationists have against evolution. Wait, I shouldn't have pluralized that. It includes the one single fundamental argument that creationists have against evolution. Evolutionists don't have a perfect explanation for thing X. Therefore, all of evolution is wrong and it must have been God. Doesn't matter if we're talking about the flagellar motor, abiogenesis, the genetic code, or some specific aspect of it, the origin of multicellularity, whatever, it's all the same. And often, there is an evolutionary explanation, but it's usually one that's more complicated than creationists are willing to deal with, so they'll respond with incredulity and pretend as though their incredulity is another point against evolution. And we saw this with his example of the ratites. They're weird and complicated and don't really fit with the simplified evolutionary model. He didn't explicitly say, therefore, evolution is false, but this is the final summary video in his series called Evidence Against Evolution. So the implication of anything he brings up in this video is that he sees it as evidence against evolution, so he doesn't have to explicitly state it. Come on, there's way more, you know, the, the creationist would say there's way more evidence against evolution. You could totally destroy it. And, and I'm quite dubious of that claim. The guy who publishes papers in the Answers Research Journal, a journal that explicitly will refuse to publish anything that does not deny evolution in old ages, and who made a whole ass series called Evidence Against Evolution, is dubious of the idea that creationists can disprove evolution? What weird twilight zone of creationism have I stumbled into? Or is this just one of those faux both sides things where Todd is pretending to give his unbiased opinion, but both sides make good points? If that's the case, then I'd have to take back any credit I've given at this point for being honest about the limitations of creationism, because if such honesty is purely for manipulative purposes, it ceases to be honesty. I mean, I can't know for certain that that's his goal. Maybe he really truly believes that he is giving an unbiased and fair to both sides presentation here. But if that's the case, then he is remarkably ignorant for someone with a PhD in biochemistry. Uh, and there are people on the other side saying, those, are, those aren't even important 
Ugh, that's not important. And, you know, evolution's going to figure all those things out eventually. It's not that those aren't important and that we believe we will figure those things out eventually. It's that we know evolution happens. It is a real demonstrable fact. Pointing to an aspect of it that is not currently understood does not change that fact, even if it is something that we never find an adequate explanation for. We got great, you know, ideas, kids selection for altruism. Oh, so you are aware of the explanation for altruism. Okay, so why would you even bring that up as something that is unexplained? Kin selection is a well-understood aspect of evolution that explains all sorts of group behaviors. Floral displays that are optimized for maximizing the number of pollinators that are attracted to a flower patch. The group structure of beluga whale pods. Even the cooperation of gut microbes. And yes, even the evolution of social bees along with other social insects. Macrobiogeography just means that evolution is proceeding in a way that we thought was not right before, and now we know is really, you know, we're learning things, and we're, we're figuring it out, and it's not bad. I like how you're saying that with a tone of derision, as though it's a bad thing that we're learning things and figuring out how everything all works together. Because as much as I said that we don't need to rely on hypothetical futures where things we don't know now have been figured out, the fact of the matter is that we are figuring things out. And really, evolution would not be an active area of research if there weren't still things to figure out about it. That's the whole point of science, figuring out shit that we don't know yet. If we already knew everything there was to know about evolution, there would be no reason to do any research or publish any papers on it. You could simply point to the research that had already been done. So as long as scientists are researching evolution, then there will be something that creationists can point to and say, aha, we don't know the explanation for this thing, therefore evolution is false. But if that were a valid argument, then you could say the same about literally any area of active research. I don't think this is all, right? I don't think this is everything. And frankly, I could go on and on. We could talk about the more ephemeral features of nature, things like beauty and the, the extraordinary way in which nature is amenable to our investigation. Well, beauty is subjective, but there is a potentially interesting conversation to be had about why we find beauty in things that have nothing to do with reproduction. That discussion is made much less interesting if you just stop it with thing purdy, so God! At its most basic, beauty is a stimulus that has the potential to elicit a response. See an attractive person, ask them on a date. See that your kid is cute, provide them with affection. From an evolutionary perspective, a sense of beauty can have a survival advantage. We find things that we are familiar with to be beautiful, which could aid in finding your way home when traveling. But we also find beauty in the unfamiliar, which causes us to not only tolerate uncertainty, but to actively seek out knowledge related to it, whether that be by exploration or investigation. So our perception of beauty impacts our decisions, and there seems to be a balance between motivators that would encourage us to stay put and settle down, and ones that would encourage exploration and resettlement. The evolutionary advantage of such features seems rather obvious to me. As to nature being amenable to our investigation, this seems to be one of those arguments that stems from the idea that God imposes order on the universe in the form of laws of nature. Because God is an orderly being, don't you know? But my question here would be, why would we expect a universe with no natural laws if there was no God? And more pertinent to the discussion, as a creationist, don't you believe in a universe where, at least occasionally, miracles happen? One day, a donkey is just a donkey. The next, he's speaking to its owner about the supernatural being it sees blocking the road. One day, the dead just stay dead. The next, they all walk out of their tombs and start visiting people in Jerusalem. One day, days are roughly 24 hours long and are slowly but consistently getting longer due to gravitational interactions. The next, the Earth stops spinning so that there can be extra daylight for some guy to finish a battle against a city. You believe that the laws of nature can change based on the whims of God. So how can you possibly say that the unchanging laws of nature are evidence for God? I could go on and on, of course, about biochemistry and arguments from biochemistry. I'm sure you could, and as a layman, I'd ordinarily defer to your expert opinion. But the problem is, the vast majority of experts in your field disagree with your conclusions. So again, as a layman, when in doubt, I'm going to go ahead and side with the majority. We could talk more about Behe's mousetrap and examples that might exist uh, in cells and genetics and so forth and the complexity argument. Yet another version of an argument from ignorance, and one that creationists have exactly backward. 
they need to find a complex molecule that has no evolutionary precursors, but the problem is, the more complex something is, the more likely it will be to still function when missing some of its parts, and the more likely it will be to have different potential functions in different potential configurations. So what they need to find is something that is irreducibly simple, something with so few components that you couldn't possibly reduce it any further and have it still have a use, or other potential uses. But the problem with that is that when you actually do that, you wind up back at abiogenesis, where lifelike protocells have been demonstrated to exhibit lifelike behaviors with just five simple chemicals that would have been abundant on the early Earth. So not only is it an argument from ignorance, but it's an argument from ignorance that creationists got backward and actually kind of works against creationism. And we could also talk about the extraordinary achievement of humanity, the human intellect, human artistic expression, ability, etc. This goes, I think, far beyond anything that evolution could really hope to produce. Why, though? There's not really anything unique to us that isn't merely a difference of degree between us and the other animals. You already brought up altruism and surprised me by talking about bees rather than humans, so by your own admission, self-sacrifice is not exclusive to humans. Rats have been consistently shown to have rudimentary moral systems, so morality is not exclusive to humans. The experience of beauty has neural correlates that exist all throughout the animal kingdom. Rational thought is present all over the place in corvids, lions, elephants, non-human apes, and more. Maybe spirituality or religion? Proto-religious rituals can, again, be found in several species, including, but not limited to, chimps, elephants, and corvids. Name a feature that humans have that makes them unique, and you can find that same feature somewhere else in nature. Maybe not as well developed as ours, but there being a difference of degree does not make the quality itself unique. Evolution is basically as slippery as an eel. I've been around evolutionary biologists a lot, I uh, follow their work, been to their conferences, even worked with some, right? and. They are really smart, and there are a lot of them, and they're really good at coming up with models and explanations. Yeah, significantly better than creationists are. Evolutionary models don't require the changing of the fundamental laws of the universe like creationist ones often do. And with all the resources that they have at their disposal, and they're all, and I'm sure there are some of them scoffing at me going, it's really hard to get a grant, blah, blah, blah. Well, at least you have the possibility of getting a grant for what you do, unlike me. Yep. No legitimate scientific institution or organization will give you a grant to study something that is already a settled question. And I imagine you'd actually agree with this. Would you expect the NSF to give one of their astronomy or astrophysics grants to a flat earther? Of course not. That would be a complete waste of money. We know that the earth isn't flat. We're not going to pay someone to try and say that it is. It's the same thing with creationism. You've got your conclusion that you're going to start with, and any research you do will be with the goal of proving that conclusion, rather than an unbiased examination of the evidence. What's more, creationists don't actually have evidence for their position. They rely exclusively on trying to poke holes in other ideas. If you poke enough holes in evolution, creation must be true. If you poke enough holes in geology, creation must be true. If you poke enough holes in astronomy, the waters from heaven will fall out of the firmament and flood the earth again. Gotta be careful with that one. But the thing is here, there are already researchers working really hard to poke holes in the various aspects of all of these sciences. But because they do it without the pre-stated goal of proving an unscientific idea, instead doing it with the goal of finding better explanations than the ones we already have, they do get grants and funding. They don't just publish papers saying, we don't know X. They publish papers saying, current explanations for X are unsatisfactory for the following reasons, so here we suggest an alternative explanation along with supporting evidence. Creationists don't do that. They just stop at the we don't know X, and then assume that not knowing X makes creationism true by default. You don't get funding for that sort of sloppiness, and that's a good thing. With all of that ability, all of that resources, all of those resources, I have no doubt that evolution is going to come up with answers for altruism, and classification, and biogeography, and the fossil record, and so forth. Not only that, but they have come up with answers for them, and as you yourself demonstrated, you are aware of those answers. You just dismiss them for some reason. Might have something to do with that conclusion that you're starting with, rather than starting with the data and seeing where they lead. So, evolution is adaptable, and powerful, and people like it. It's not that people like it, it's that it's what's indicated by all the evidence. I'd actually wager that there are people who accept evolution as the explanation for the diversity of life who don't like it. Actually, 
No, no need to wager. I'll go ahead and tell you that that's me. The way evolution works is through suffering and death, which is why creationists can't have it happening before the fall brought evil into the world. I don't like that animals starving to death is a selection mechanism that drives evolution. I'd rather that all animals have comfortable lives for their entire lives. But my not liking evolution does not make it not true. And despite my not liking it on a visceral level, it is intensely interesting to learn about. But I think there's a more important thing here about why I don't just go on and on and on about all the problems with evolution. And that is very simple. What I really need to be doing <laughs> is working on my own explanation, right? Wait, what? Is this going to be the one time a creationist actually brings something to the table to replace evolution, rather than just assuming that if evolution is false, creationism is true? I don't want to get my hopes up, but damn, you basically said exactly that. Okay, let's hear it. And if I'm going to say your model is terrible and it's got all these problems, the correct response to that is, fine, but what's your model? What do you propose instead? What's your explanation? Yeah, come on, get to it. There's only two minutes left in his video, so I don't expect this to be an amazing and thorough explanation. But at least give me something other than the Bible said it, so I believe it. And if I want to make an impact on science and make an impact on scientist thinking, then I need to be doing more than just poking holes. I need to be doing the hard work of science, which is explaining the data. There's now a minute and 21 seconds left. Are you going to actually do that or nah? which is what Core Academy is all about. Yeah, so this is basically the subscribe to my channel pitch. Well, I perused the channel, and as far as I can tell, the only thing he could be talking about is the creationist idea of baromenology, which is what they call the study of created kinds. And yeah, that is the creationist attempt to replace evolution, but the problem is that it basically amounts to assuming that created kinds are a thing, and then arbitrarily deciding where to draw the line to make it a thing. So, for instance, he gave the example of penguins and other closely related birds. When shown on a regular phylogeny, we see that penguins are very closely related to other birds like albatrosses, loons, and puffins. But he then took information about the similarities between these birds, which could mean a bunch of different things, but he never specifies, and plotted them out, with circles representing individual species, and the distance between the circles representing how different they are from each other. So the closer two circles are, the more similar they are. And he claims that this shows a very clear divide between categories, with penguins being clustered over on the left of the image and the other birds on the right, which would indicate that the penguin is a created kind. Now, just taking him at face value here, I measured the distance between the two farthest penguins from each other. It was 800 pixels. I then measured the distance between the penguin and the other bird that is the closest, and it was 830 pixels. And for reference, I measured the bottom penguin with its closest neighbor, and that was 50 pixels, meaning that the difference between the penguin closest to the other birds and the other bird to which it is closest is only greater than the distance between the two most distantly related penguins by less than the amount of difference between two very close penguins. Given this information, why are the penguins way up by themselves at the top still included in the penguin group? Or, if we say they should be included, why is the difference between those two groups of penguins not significant enough to call it a different kind, but the only very slightly larger difference between penguins and the other birds is enough to call them a different kind? This all seems entirely arbitrary. Creationists will tell you that baromenology is what you get when you look at the similarities between organisms without starting with evolutionary assumptions, but they give no reason for why there would be barriers to change. Like, a puffin and a penguin are not all that different from each other. You could hypothetically turn one into the other with very minor changes, but they are two distinct kinds that are completely unrelated? Why could evolution not turn a common ancestor that was similar to both of them into what they are today? They assume without evidence that there are barriers to evolutionary change, and then stick them in in arbitrary places. And then they argue over the placement of things like Australopithecus sediba, being unable to figure out whether they belong in the same baromen as humans, or a completely unrelated created kind of ape. And I would argue that their inability to make that determination is actually itself evidence for evolution. 
So yeah, I guess I'll grant that Baraminology is an attempt to provide a replacement for evolution, but even given that, this guy's channel is mostly just full of the same hole poking that he said isn't enough to prove creation. But Baraminology isn't actually an attempt to replace evolution, it's more of a have your cake and eat it too endeavor. They can't deny that evolution happens, so they have to account for it, but because of their starting assumption of creationism, it has to be cut off somewhere or else the whole tree of life ends up staring them straight in the face with the idea that all life on Earth is related. And that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from CloudyT3121, who says, Neurospicy. Please don't use that word. It's cringe at best, ableist at worst. Well, I can't change your opinion about whether or not it's cringe, but that's the word I use to refer to myself when talking about the fact that I am neurodivergent. I like it better than the more technically correct term neurodivergent, because divergent has a rather negative connotation. Divergent is different in a bad way. Spicy is different in an interesting way. That's how I look at it at any rate, and I know I'm not the only neurospicy person who sees it that way. Though I do also know that there are others who agree with you that it is kind of cringe. I don't think it's ableist, though. I actually argue that neurodivergent comes closer to being ableist because of the aforementioned negative connotation that comes with the word divergent. Though, to be fair, you didn't specify that that's the term you'd prefer, so maybe you agree with me on that and just have a different opinion about what word should be used as a substitute. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I live stream with service every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the sednoid objects to the unexplained orbits of my channel. If you'd like to not exist because observable things don't exist if they behave in unexplained ways, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!